Welcome back to the classroom, my name is Mr Wong. Today we'll be going through module 8, inquiry question 1, and with particular focus on precipitation tritrophics. So the lesson intention is to discuss the different types of methods of precipitation titrations to find inorganic substances and we're going to look at the actual method and calculations required to do such a task. So titration is an example of a volumetric analysis as you can see that's the setup for titration you would remember this from module 6 Volumetric analysis, titration, is a use of volume to determine the concentration of an unknown solution using a concentration of a known solution, which we call the titrant. And the thing that we're trying to examine, we also call it the analyte. So we have the analyte. And we have the known solution, which is the titrant. You have different types of titrations. You have acid base titration, so that's through neutralization reactions. You have complexation titrations using metal ligands, redox titrations. The one we're focusing on is precipitation titrations, where it involves us creating a precipitate during the process of titration. You might recall the main components of a titration setup. You have your measuring cylinder. You have your pipette. You have your burette. And you have your volumetric flask. Your volumetric flask should contain your known solution and your pipette should also hold the known solution uh, that you want to investigate. It could be the other way around. Um, it doesn't really matter. Usually you would try and use the limiting um, solution for your pipette and the one that you have in great abundance, you can use it for your burette, but it doesn't really matter. The use of titration is to find the equivalence point. So the point at which the amount of titrant, so one solution you're using is equivalent chemically speaking. So in terms of number of moles, have the same number of moles as the solution you're trying to investigate. The end point is slightly different from equivalence point. The end point is the situation where the reaction's completion becomes observable. So that could be the form of a color change uh, if we're using an indicator. Um, so that's different, slightly different from equivalence point. Equivalence point is where we have equal amounts. End point is when we see that occurring. So there are two types of titration methods. One is through direct titration. So in a direct titration, you add your standard solution to analyze an unknown solution until you reach the end point. If you do a thing called back titration, you have to add excess amount of your standard solution, so the solution that you know of, uh, to your unknown solution. You then titrate the extra uh, standard solution to determine how much there was in excess. So the reason why back titration is used is it's great if the end point is easy to observe, particularly for things like precipitation titrations. Direct titrations are better for really um, less obvious or more distinct um, changes, so something like a neutralization reaction. Okay, so let's look at precipitation titrations and the three types of methods of it. Okay, so it's a technique used to determine the quantity of particular ions of concern. The precipitating agent we're going to be using is silver nitrate. There are three methods, the Moore's method, where we use the indicator of potassium chromate. We have the Volhard's method, which we use an iron salt solution 
or the Fajan's method where we use Thrissen. So these are the three methods we have. Let's go through each of them and then we'll look at some calculations related to precipitation titrations. Okay, so Moore's method. You can sort of see here, um, we have very distinct colors and there is a specific reason why these are the colors that we are going to look at. With Moore's method, by using chromate ions as an indicator, the thing that we're going to titrate are aldehyde ions, so things like uh, chloride, bromines. It could also be um, cyanides, that works too. When these aldehydes react with the silver nitrate, it will form a brownish precipitate of silver chromite. Okay, so the excess silver we add to the chromite ions will give us this brownish color. That's when we know we've reached an end point in our titration, when we see that instant color change. So you can see here, it's forming this reddish color. So once the, how to put it, once the silver has reacted in excess with the aldehyde, then it reacts with the chromite and that's where we get this reddish color. Before there you can see it's quite white and so that's what we see here. So before the addition of any silver chromite indicator it gives a clear yellow solution. Once we've added it we'll get a whitish solution first because the silver will react with the chlorine to make our precipitate. Once we've reacted all the chloride ions, then we get this reddish color, that's the silver chromite. Okay, so that's the original reaction that we'll get first. Once we've passed this reaction, that's when we see the reaction we saw beforehand. The problem with this method is that once all the chloride ions are used up by the silver, it takes it still takes a significant amount of silver to change the chromite from yellow to red um, thus we need to use a blank okay so we have to start off at some um, blank spot as reference right so let's do a quick calculation question related to the moore's method so titration was completed using the moore's method using a chromite ion indicator to determine the concentration of chloride in solution. A blanket titration requirement or required this amount of silver nitrate to achieve a color change and then 25 ml of an unknown solution required 33.7 milliliters of titrant to each to reach the end point. Calculate the chloride concentration on the unknown sample. Okay. So the titrant that we um, used here is 33.7 milliliters. We also used a blank of 0 0.5 milliliters in this solution. So the blank is sort of like the standard we add for this observation here. So in reality, okay, the volume used to reach endpoint, so the volume of AgNO3 to reach endpoint is actually 33.7 milliliters subtracted by 0 0.5 milliliters. So that gives us 33.2 milliliters there. So that's actually how much we actually needed to use to reach the end point of the one that we desired. The next thing we need to know is how many moles of silver nitrate did we use in this reaction? And then subsequently, how much silver did we use in this reaction? So the number of moles of silver nitrate is given as concentration times volume. The concentration that we have as you can see here is one mole per liter times 0.032. Don't forget to convert this into liters. Okay, so the number of moles we have is 
10 to the power 3 moles. If we look at how many moles of silver we have, you can actually see in the um, equation or the chemical formula of silver nitrate, you only need one mole of silver to make one mole of silver nitrate. So that would be n times or be just 1 times 33.2 again. So it will also have the exact same number of moles. So we need the exact same number of moles of silver to make the number of moles of silver nitrate that we get here. Next, we need to write out a balanced chemical equation because that silver is now reacted with chlorine. So silver plus chlorine gives you silver chloride. Okay, so plus here, minus here, and then we get our precipitate solid here. Okay, you can see it's a one-to-one -one mole ratio, so the amount of silver we have will be equal to the amount of chloride I have. So chloride also has the same number of moles used. Okay, now I'm really struggling for area on this PowerPoint, so I might just use a little space down here. Okay, then the last thing we want to know is the concentration of chlorine uh, used in this solution. So using the formula um, C equals to N divided by V, we know that the and I'll just write that this is for the chloride. We know that the number of moles of chloride used is 33.2 times 10 to the power of 2. The volume that we use in the titration was 25 milliliters, so 25 minus 3, sorry. That would be 25 10 to the power of minus 3. So plug that into our calculator and we get a value along the lines of 1.33 moles per liter and that's how you do a question like this let's go to the next type of titration the next one is the Vollard method as you can see here trying to create precipitations again with the Volhard's method, we use back titration and iron 3 plus to indicate um, the titration with aldehydes, phosphates, chromates, sulfides, carbonates, and cyanide. So we use um, silver ions to complete this process. What the silver nitrates will do, or what the silver does, is it will first react with the aldehyde to form a metal aldehyde. The excess titration reacts with the standard thiocyanate solution and we get a color change. That color change will be a distinct blood red color. We form ions thiocyanate there afterwards. So that's our method of finding these um, ions using the Volhard's method. Okay. Now, Going to the calculation again, we have a student who wants to determine the concentration of iodide iron presented in a particular solution. The student added 50 milliliters of this solution of silver nitrate to a 25 milliliter solution. The excess silver nitrate was done against the sodium thiocyanate. Iron 3 plus was used as an indicator for the endpoint. Calculate the concentration of the iodide ion present in this sample. Okay, so to start ourselves off, we just need to write a couple of chemical equations. And the first one is the 
silver formation with the iodide. So we have silver forming with iodide, that's silver iodide, so it's a one to one ratio. You can write your state of matter. We also have the silver reacting with the thiocyanate. We know that cyanate is negative one. So Ag, so that's also a one-to-one -one mole ratio. We want to work out the amount of silver nitrate we have in our disposal. So the amount of silver nitrate is 50 milliliters converted into liters with the amount of concentration. So that's our value there. And we also have the concentration of the thiocyanate uh, to have a look at. Okay, so those are the two values. So that's 0 0.445 moles, and this one here is 0 0.0373 moles. Notice that this will also tell us the number of moles of silver plus and thiocyanate because they are just one to one mole ratios with their compound. So Let's just go over this. We said that the silver reacts with the iodine to make silver iodide. Once we have surpassed that, so once all the silver and the iodine have reacted together, the excess amount of silver will then react with the thiocyanate and we get the changing blood red color. Okay, we know how much thiocyanate was used um, that was in match of uh, 42.3 milliliters so the actual amount so if we kind of break this down again so the actual amount of moles we used to get or to mix the silver with the iodine to make the silver iodide we can find that by subtracting the total amount of silver we used in this reaction by the number of moles of thiocyanate we used in the reaction as well. Because remember, this is the excess component. So anything after that excess or subtracting away that excess, that must have been all the silver we originally used in this reaction. So the amount so the amount of Ag uh, reacting to our iodine is 0.44 moles subtracted by 0.0373. Whoops, just need to correct a value. So that was an extra zero. Got my extra zeros here. So the value I should get is 00720 moles. Okay, now we want to know the overall concentration of iodine. Now we know that the silver nitrate was originally mixed to a solution of 25 milliliters. So the 25 milliliters is the contribution of the iodine ion. So that means that we must have used this quantity of iodine to react with the um, silver ions. So the overall concentration of iodine, and we know that it's a one to one mole ratio, so we can just use this value here. It's the number of moles divided by volume. So the number of moles is given here. The volume was 25 milliliters. 
And so the grand concentration of the iodine was 0 0.288 moles per liter. And that's how you do a question related to uh, precipitation calculations there. All right, the last method we have is the Fajan's method. I assume I'm pronouncing it right, but we'll see. So you can see some diagrams to show it. So this method involves a direct titration, a direct titration, get rid of that. With the end point being determined by color change using an absorption indicator. So we're trying to look at the quantity of you know, color that's absorbed. So the indicator absorbs onto the surface of the precipitate at the end point and changes color. What you can see here is different endpoints will require a different indicator to represent the color change. So you can see the selections that we have here. The fluorescent one, it will apply for our aldehydes, while as um, these other ones will apply for other chemicals we use. So there's that. Okay, so there are some issues with using this method. If the species being analyzed is present only in low concentrations, since there will not be enough precipitate for the indicator to change color, so that is one issue. A low concentration means a really weak color change. Or if there are significant quantities of non-reacting ions, since the indicator may colligate with these ions and not absorb, absorb onto the precipitate and so a color change may not be observed. So probably out of the three methods, and this one is probably the one you might not want to use as much um, in terms of the methods, uh, but that is the third and final precipitation titration method we have. Okay, so just a quick conclusion on the three titration methods. The Moore's method is a direct titration, Volhard's direct titration for silver ions, back titrations for anions, and Fajan's is a direct titration. In terms of indicators used, the Moore's one, we use chromite ions. With Volhard's, we use um, the thiocyanate, and Fajan's, it could be any particular indicator. As you can see, these are the species that can be analyzed by the three methods and also some additional information in terms of limitations that need to be taken into account. So that concludes our lesson for today. Hopefully you gain a better understanding of how to perform precipitation calculations and also understand the three methods of completing precipitation titrations. Thank you for watching this video up till now. Give it a like for support for other videos to come out in the future. And I'll see you next time. Take care.